offering hospitality to strangers, including refugees and the displaced, is a gift that surpasses narrow and divisive definitions of religion. In the Bekaa Valley of Lebanon, these ordinary Lebanese women, Christian, Muslim, and Druze, work together to prepare food for refugees from war-wracked Syria. Religious groups who offer hospitality often find themselves transformed by the experience. My name is Rolf Held. I am the local Methodist minister here in Messstetten and in Albstadt Ebingen, a town 10 kilometers from here. And I was a pastor in a rural church here, very quiet. We enjoyed doing the things one did in Germany, drinking a beer, watching football, celebrating services on Sunday and caring for our, about our own thing. And then last year we got the news that um, the army barracks here in Messstetten, which had been empty for a year, were going to take in refugees. They promised us a maximum of 1,000 refugees in a town of approximately um, 6,000 inhabitants. Yes, yeah, so now we have just over 3,500 refugees in this small little town. And it's been a very interesting process to see how the population reacts to it. This is a very rural place, far away from the big cities. They've never seen much of the big wild world around them. And now it's dropped right in front of their doorstep. They've risen to the challenge. There's over 150 people doing voluntary work here. And the administration would never be able to cope without the people doing voluntary work. We're having interesting, um, interesting conversations with um, the refugees coming in. People are very different. We have mainly people from Syria, from Iraq, from Iran, Afghanistan, to a lesser degree from Eritrea in Africa. And we try to get to know the people, listen to their stories, find out um, how long it took them to get here, why they left home, what they experienced at home. Some of the experiences have been very harrowing and difficult to take in. And we found that we've met a lot of great people here. We have a lot of, most of the people coming here are Muslims. Um, we found they are very open. They come to our Christian services in our local Methodist church. A lot of them want to find out what do Christians do. They come in. We do not try to convert each other. We try to speak with each other, share our faith. Um, let us know, let each other know what we believe in and how we wish to live our faith. So we've been getting along very well. We've been finding that the refugees coming here are very, very helpful. We have a lady in our church. She has MS. She can hardly walk anymore. And um, she got befriended with uh, some people from Iran. They washed her car. They painted her um, house. Um, they fixed up her garden. They've packed up her cellar. They've come every day to see if they can help her. We've had this kind of helpfulness uh, throughout the whole year. It's been an incredible experience how these people want to give back a little of what we try to convey to them. When the refugee crisis in Europe began six years ago and hundreds of thousands of refugees started flowing toward Western Europe, governments and NGOs were slow in responding. It was ordinary people, fishers, farmers, who responded to welcome the boats and save those drowning off islands in Greece. All around Europe, people organized themselves on social media to meet and welcome the migrants, even as their own governments at times rejected the newcomers. Such a massive outpouring of solidarity wasn't enough, however, and many refugees didn't make it. This Afghan boy had new shoes, and we can imagine the family buying them with the excitement of setting off to start a new life far from war. Yet during the crossing from Turkey to Greece, the Aegean took away one of those new shoes, just as it took away his dream of living somewhere, anywhere, in peace.
Such grassroots solidarity is more necessary than ever. Immigrants have proved especially vulnerable to HIV, and more recently, people living in crowded camps or on the road have little ability to protect themselves from the coronavirus. At the same time, the climate crisis is driving more and more people to leave home, even though they aren't afforded protection by current international refugee law. Many people today are driven from their homes by violence, and given global imbalances of power, protest usually gets them nowhere. Cambodians displaced by giant development projects are repressed if they protest. Indigenous groups in the Philippines have their leaders assassinated and are forced out of their traditional villages by giant mining operations, forced to take refuge in church compounds. In Brazil, the rural poor have their forest homes destroyed by loggers. Native peoples in Argentina lose their land to giant fields where corporations grow soybeans for China. From one end of the earth to the other, people are forced to flee their homes in order to survive. When they resist, as these farmers resisted the theft of their land for a palm oil plantation in Honduras, they pay a heavy price. The number of refugees, displaced, and stateless people is growing, and so are the challenges they face. As people of many faith expressions, let's continue to unite to give voice to the voiceless, offering refuge and health to all who are forced to leave their homes, in the process opening ourselves to be blessed in our encounter with the migrants in our midst.